Welcome everybody. This is the JBI Live webinar, um, the last one for 2003. And uh, the, this webinar is going to be focused on aged care and we'll be talking about aged care excellence, uh, supporting healthcare professionals to deliver evidence-based quality care. Uh, so before I start, just like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I'd just like to acknowledge that the lands that we are delivering this presentation um, and all the panelists are delivering the presentation to you on today is on the lands of the Ghana people. Uh, the Ghana people have occupied our lands for thousands of years and have been caring for the land and the water that surround us. And we'd like to take this time to acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of the land and their connection to the land, sea and community. We'd also like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. So let's kick off the session. Our first session, if I ask Jennifer to turn on her video as I introduce her. So our first presentation today is from Professor Jennifer Tierman. Professor Tierman is a Matthew Flinders Professor and the inaugural director of the Research Centre for Palliative Care, Death and Dying within the College of Nursing and Health Sciences at Flinders University. She is a Care Search and Palliative, Palliative Age Director, co-lead of the Elder, LDAC project and Director of the Knowledge and Implementation Hub in ARIA, which is an aged care centre focused on workforce capability, sector growth and translational research. She brings to these projects best practice approaches to evidence retrieval and appraisal, digital translation through online solutions and strategic communication and dissemination and formative summative evaluation strategies. Professor Tierman is involved with a range of advisory and review groups and is also the foundational fellow of the Australian Institute of Digital Health. And it is our pleasure to have Professor Tierman talking to us today on her presentation titled A Knowledge Hub of Aged Care. So I'll hand over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kylie. And I'm really delighted to be here today. I'm actually presenting um, for the Aged Care Growth and Translation Centre, which has come to be known as ARI, or the Aged Care Research and Industry Innovation Australia. And I'm going to be introducing you to the whole ARIA project, but uh, realistically, I'm going to be mostly focused on the hub. And we're taking it safe because I did have a fire alarm, so um, we're having somebody else turn the slides. So next, please. Um, can I also acknowledge our meeting on the lands of the Ghana people and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging? Next, please. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is have a little moment just to think about this, what we mean by aged care excellence. And I want to introduce ARIA and its role within aged care and our directions. I want to also look particularly at the role of knowledge and how that relates not only to evidence-based practice, but increasingly to how we use knowledge in context. And I'll talk specifically about some of the processes um, and the ways we're going about developing the knowledge and implementation hub within the ARIA site. And I guess last, I want to talk about the role of evidence in aged care um, and it, touching through all of this is how healthcare and aged care intersect in this space. Next, please. So when, when I was sent this topic, I actually went back to the Department of Health and Aged Care to look at what they were saying in, about the response to the uh, Royal Commission into Safety and Quality and Aged Care. And they had this interesting statement, which really was, um, if you like, their summary about restoring dignity to aged care. And so how the aged care reform should be putting older Australians first and improving quality, safety and choice in aged care. And that has obvious implications for care and health care for older people as well. And so they wanted to have a trusted, safe and high quality care. They wanted equitable access for older people, care that actually saw the older people at the center, sustainable care given an aging population and accountability and transparency in, in knowing what we're doing as making a difference. And I think they're an admirable set of aims. And I guess the question for me it raised is how can we support evidence-based quality care and effective services in this sector? Next slide, please. 
So the context for all of the work that I'm doing in relation to this part of aged care is ARIA's role. And ARIA has a specific role in looking at the increased aged care workforce capability. And aged care increasingly has a recognised um, perspective in terms of maintaining health and well-being with older people, which obviously speaks to the question of evidence-based practice in these areas. There's, so there's two focuses that are really important in ARIA's role. One is about growth, so the increasing capacity to adopt products, solutions, technologies, innovations, which could apply within the aged care sector from different sectors and from different um, ways where people do business in relation to aged care. And the other is really about translational research, which is how do we take the best of evidence-based practice and look at how it can be adopted into aged care. Next slide, please. So we'll, I'll be talking um, a little bit about some of the sector priorities that have already been identified and have been introduced into the ARIA website. Now, ARIA is only two years old and we already have 12 major topics that have aligned in terms of the knowledge base, the practice into ITP, which I'll explain in a minute, and into the aged care partnering process. If you click again, something else will pop up. Uh, so ARIA is built around a series of interacting work streams. <clears throat> the first is um, looking at a knowledge and implementation hub. So to have an underlying base of evidence and knowledge that supports uh, change, care practices, service delivery but also a specific series of initiatives related to workforce capability and capacity, a broader set of um, a program that looks at how we can look at partnering. So to look at relationships with universities, with industry and with aged care in terms of developing the innovation that will support the development of the sector. There was also an opportunity for ARIA to run a grants program, which was focused on aged care and actually innovation creating change, introducing and adopting evidence-based practices and scaling some of the existing evidence into broader contexts for aged care. So these are multi-stream programs which are focused on delivering outcomes for the workforce. Just click again, please. <laughs> Um, our work is underpinned by a series of principles, uh, so we're committed to co-design to actually working with the workforce and we're appropriate with older people directly to look at how we should be developing our products and our resources. We're trying to heavily in involve connection and engagement, so ownership of what we're doing, looking at inclusion and diversity and how that is worked in those areas, and how we also implement innovation and technology into the sector. And these are obviously things that have been reflected in healthcare uh, directions as well. Next slide, please. So when we were talking about the workforce capability, the, the core part of this relates to innovative training. So this is really saying, aged care workers, they can come with a problem or a challenge and ARIA will support them in looking at a, an evidence-based solution, a project plan, in helping them to understand evidence and how to apply and implement evidence within their um, sector or their service and looking at what is the project management that's involved with those change processes. It started with a 10-week delivery and because we realise aged care is um, coping with many things at the moment, we've adjusted the program to what people have come back and said, we'd love to do it, can we do it like this? So we have a 10-week delivery now, a five-week delivery, a five-week intensive and in-house tailored solutions as well. Next slide, please. Running alongside and uh, on from the ITP is the Aged Care Partnering Program. And what this is identifying and working with is projects which might have a broader and more scalable uh, capacity for the sector. So what we're looking at trying to do is work with industry and with uh, research and the aged care sector in partnerships to solve real world problems and to make use of solutions that are emerging. And more recently, what we've done is introduced a short, shorter term uh, focused incubator process to try and identify what might be the next directions for um, innovation in aged care based upon the medical device partnering program. Next slide, please. Once people have been involved with ARIA, either through the ITP or the aged care partnering program, 
there's a chance to maintain that relationship in terms of an innovation uh, network. So this is about providing, if you like, a community of practice that will enable people to stay connected, to continue to build knowledge and skills. And what we do is we're very driven in responsiveness to what the um, alumni are wanting. So we do network discussions, there's drop-ins, there's webinars and extension modules on specialist topics that people bring to our attention. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned the grants before. So the grants program has closed for because we needed, in terms of our grant with um, the Commonwealth, we needed to have time for people to deliver the grants. And what we had was um, two pathways. We really wanted to support aged care to start building uh, research and grant capability uh, from within the areas. So there were the capabilities for people to work together, but uh, an aged care service had to be involved. Um, we held 60% um, uh, of grants to come through the ITP or the um, aged care partnering process. 20% needed to benefit Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The work was done uh, in terms of assessing which projects was done by an independent and external assessment panel to actually provide it with a proper level of uh, responsibility with that. And we also required the project teams to be able to commit some funds into the project themselves. And we thought that was demonstrating their commitment to the change and the work and the research that laid, um, was being funded by the grant. And there's an opportunity to go to the ARIA website and read about the grants that have already been awarded. And uh, to we will be continuing to update what the research is telling us as it comes through. Next slide, please. Um, coming to the knowledge and implementation hub. So this is, if you like, uh, the base of how we bring evidence into the whole of the program. And we, we started by wanting to reconceive evidence for the aged care sector. And we wanted it to be seen as a cycle of engagement and of practice rather than something that happened over here and was reported within um, a guideline. We wanted it to be as far as possible, relevant, meaningful and interactive. And we knew we needed to think about knowledge in different forms and also knowledge within the context of aged care. And that led us to think about what would we put in it. How, you know, we'd need synthesized evidence, but we needed tools that would help people to use evidence. We needed to be promoting them to use the evidence and we wanted to be growing the evidence base as well. Next slide, please. At this stage, I just want to have a little detour and say, so why is knowledge so important? Well, if we think about it, knowledge is used to inform decisions. It's used to drive change and growth and redevelopment. It can build capability in teams and in a workforce. It can support opportunities that will improve outcomes for people and for communities. And that's really important when we think about um, both health and social care. We also know that there's research evidence that is waiting to be used and research evidence that from other sections or groups that could be adopted and adapted for aged care. And we also wanted to remind people that evidence actually gives shape to the context and facilitates implementation. This idea about understanding what are the specific issues that aged care faces, who are the population they're serving, can actually help us uh, more tailor the evidence to meet those needs. And evidence is held at the interest knowledge through evidence is held at the individual level. It also informs service practice, as well as the sector's approach and sector knowledge. Next slide, please. So this is what we decided to do in a focused hub on uh, knowledge and implementation for ARIA. We wanted to bring the evidence together in a meaningful way on the critical topics that the sector told us were important. We wanted to reflect the evidence landscape so the broad sweep, as well as summaries on what is known to work in more specific themes or, or aspects under a major topic. We wanted it to be more than words, so to provide practical tools and resources that could be picked up and used by the sector, but which had quality embedded in them. We wanted to encourage interest in how things change and what implementation could mean as well. We wanted to shortcut how people could find research and evidence by bringing it together and providing tools to help them find it. We wanted to also connect to what was out there in terms of organisations, services and programs to network, um, if you like, the evidence and research within the other activities that were occurring. And we wanted to also hear the voices from not only experts, but from the people who are practising and from older people themselves. 
And we lastly wanted evidence we were cre creating to be used both within and across the ARIA programs. And the little um, infographic on the side just gives you an idea of what we've managed to achieve at the, the sort of numeric level in the two years we've been uh, in functioning. Next. So how do we identify needs? Well, there's an annual survey that goes out uh, on ARIA on priority topics. We include feedback loops in our websites. We actually look at what is getting traction in terms of being used or uh, approaches and engagement. We get feedback from project supporters and from people who say what we lack is this. We go to roadshows, conference presentations and spend time talking with people about what's important. We read the reports, publications and we're working with the aged care um, agencies. And that's actually so we can triangulate what are the important components that are seen as priorities within the aged care sector. Next, please. Um, just a quick overview of our quality processes, and I think for most people who are familiar with JBI, they will be very familiar with quality processes. Uh, so in terms of content, we do a scoping. With, so any of the priority topics that are brought to us and accepted uh, as core for the aged care, we have a formal content process, which involves a scoping review of systematic reviews, environment, a formal environmental scan to identify relevant resources, a project scan that's overseen by an expert advisory group, um, we provide context information as well, such as what is the population structure. We work against known and best practice accessibility and digital standards. We hold readability standards and we're looking at diversification of content formats. Next slide, please. Um, evidence advisory groups have an important role in the sense that they um, not only bring their expertise, but they they say, is this contextualized directly for aged care? Um, they can they go critical reviewers for us on what we're saying are the emerging evidence themes from the uh, literature and systematic reviews we undertake. They provide advice on how we should be thinking about evidence use within the practice area. And they also tell us about additional resources that should be in there. Next, please. And I guess the last thing in the KIH itself or the hub is really about how do we encourage people to use it um, with it and how can we encourage people to bring it into practice. So obviously they're used within our grants and our training activities, uh, which is part of an implementation process in itself. But the practice resources you can sort by setting role or content type. So we're trying to have shortcuts to what could work for different groups. And um, with that, we also put in searching resources so people can have one click searching to get to a piece of evidence uh, in the publicly available databases. We look at implementation approaches and also voices from the sector. Next, please. So what does it look like? Uh, so what I've done is a snapshot of some of the things that you would see on one of our topics, which is the rehabilitation, reablement and restorative care. We always provide the scoping review summary, which is downloadable. Each of the themes that arise from that scoping review, we create as a summary document that people can again download and think about how that could work. We have little learning modules that are companions to the more formal training in the ITP. Each topic will have um, embedded PubMed searches, so one click to get to evidence. And we're trialing now putting tiles out with the key findings that can help people uh, look at how to take it up into practice immediately. Next, please. So, so there's obviously quite a challenge in just assembling evidence in undertaking all the content uh, review that's required for it in getting the expert um, advisory group and the evidence groups together in looking at how we create uh, the architecture for a website. And that's taken a lot of the first year to do that work and to get it. So we're creating additional content as we go forward. And we're also facing um, the reality of maintaining currency in these areas. But for all those challenges, there's a, an even bigger challenge in how do we share and use the evidence so that the evidence has value for both the health and the aged care sectors. And it, obviously we are connecting through the ARIA programs themselves um, so that uh, the Knowledge Hub is embedded in the grants, the ITP, and more recently we're looking at themed ITPs to pick up very specific topics rather than the very broad generic topics that were originally identified by the aged care sector. But we've also done um, a number of what we call hub initiatives. So we've created knowledge blogs. So we have a, we have about 50 blogs that people have written for us, which is really about either a researcher or a practitioner 
talking about a resource and how it can be used in the sector or in a service or by an individual clinician. We have a Knowledge Connect newsletter, which is really about connecting researchers and practitioners with the evidence and what we're doing in um, that hub. And we've probably got a couple of thousand people that might be associated with that. We obviously have started with social media tiles, and we also have what we're calling evidence snacks, which are just these little five to 20 slide um, education learning modules. They're, they're not really education, they're not really learning, the introductory concepts that we introduce around evidence and how they apply in aged care, because we see that sometimes evidence in the way that it's used in healthcare is slightly foreign in aged care. So often they'll talk about evidence for reporting purposes rather than evidence for clinical care. And so we're looking at building some knowledge around that. And we're also starting to look at infographics as mobile knowledge that we can share with the sector. Next, please. Um, we've, we also think it's really important we understand what's happening. So we have a formal uh, research plan um, that has been approved by the Ethics Committee at Flinders, which is really about us uh, designing, developing and evaluating the resources so that we can start to have some understanding of how things work and why things work. And particularly the core thing we want to do is explore the role and value of online aged care knowledge being available to the aged care sector. And we have a series of sub-studies that we're running into that process, and that's information we'll want to share going forward. Next slide, please. So if I return to um, my very original question, which was supporting aged care excellence. So how do I think um, the hub can support aged care excellence? Well, I think it provides an opportunity to benefit from what is known to be effective and to make use of what we already have researched. It acknowledges that aged care has critical pressing problems and they are both health and, uh, and social care uh, specific and that there's the need for an evidence base to inform how practice occurs in aged care. We're trying to shorten the distance to knowledge that can inform both direct clinical care and also service delivery. What we're finding is we can highlight where evidence gaps exist and or opportunities for more spread or scalability of effective materials. We're encouraging a testing and a planning approach to how we use evidence in the sector. And we're looking at um, priority topics, but we're also looking at context topics, not just clinical topics. So if we, if we think there's two aged care priority topics, one is technology and one is staff burnout. And this is beyond clinical care, which is really to say these are the surrounding factors that influence how we provide care. And I guess the other thing is KIH is part of a broader approach in our area, which is encouraging evidence use, research practice connection, workforce capability and innovation. And I think my next slide is about where you can find us. So if you put in our it will come up, please visit us. And um, if you have any questions whatsoever, you can contact us at our and we're happy to help. So thank you, which is my final slide. Thank you, Jennifer. That was amazing. That's so much work is coming out of ARIA and so many useful resources. Um, Thank you so much. So you have a couple of questions directly, but I'll give them to you um, in the panel session. So if I could just ask Susan, um, our next presenter, Susan Bellman, to turn her video on. Thank you, Susan, just as I introduce you. So Susan Bellman is an accomplished professional combining expertise as a pharmacist, a dietitian, and a diabetes educator with a passion for evidence-based healthcare. In her current role, she is the academic lead for the JBI aged care specialty field. Working with key stakeholders within the field, Susan develops point of care resources that promote and support the use of the best available evidence to inform clinical decision making and practice. Susan will be presenting to us today uh, the JBI aged care field, um, a presentation on supporting decision making around care to older adults. So thank you, Susan. Thank you. Well, hello everybody. Um, today um, I'll be discussing how JBI's evidence-based practice resources can be used to inform and support healthcare professionals when making decisions in their workplace, in their clinical setting. 
So for the first half of the presentation, I'll be talking about the different types of resources that JBI has with a particular focus on the aged care resources. And then for the second part of my presentation, I'll be talking about an aged care mapping uh, project that we are currently undertaking, which is using the aged care quality standards program and also the aged care quality indicator program, just to illustrate how the aged care evidence-based resources can be used in the clinical setting. So I just wish to uh, declare that I do not believe that I've got any uh, conflicts of interest. So the aged care resources. So specifically the aged care resources are contained on JBI's aged care specialty field. And there are a wide variety of aged care resources in the field um, on a variety of different topics, ranging from falls prevention to medication safety, uh, pressure injuries, person-centred care, and the list really just goes on and on. So we've got um, a number of different resources and I just like to go through these resources. So I just like to note at this stage that um, I will be talking specifically about aged care resources, but we do have aged, uh, we do have resources on a, a wide variety of other specialty fields as well. But specifically, specifically for aged care, we've got evidence summaries, we've got recommended practices, we've got audit criteria and best practice information sheets. And I just like to go through and just explain each of those individually. So the evidence summaries, as the name suggests, is a summary of the evidence. So it is a, a short abstract summarising the evidence. Um, evidence summaries will all, always have best practice recommendations associated with them down the bottom of the resource. When we um, develop evidence summaries, we always follow a structured process, which is rigorous and um, uses evidence-based methodology. So moving on now to the recommended practices. So recommended practices are developed from the evidence that comes out of evidence summaries. So using the best practice recommendations that have come out of the evidence summaries and we can um, produce recommended practices. Now recommended practices contain standardized procedures, if you like, that can be used in the clinical setting to help support uh, the care of older adults. Next, we have audit criteria. Now, audit criteria um, may or may not be associated with evidence summaries. So what I mean by that is some evidence summaries have audit criteria and some evidence summaries might not be appropriate to have audit criteria. But audit criteria, as you would know, are standards or statements against which current performance or current practice is compared or evaluated. Now these audit criteria can be used to support um, quality improvement projects that you may be conducting in your workplace and they also make up part of JBI's um, implementation uh, project um, program. The last resource that I have on the slide there is best practice information sheets. Now that are actually um, a summary of JBI's uh, systematic reviews. But today we won't be talking about those. We'll only be focusing on the first three resources. So how many aged care resources do we have on JBI's evidence-based practice database? So we've got over 430 evidence summaries. We've got over 100 recommended practices and they are accessed by over 4,500 facilities in 61 countries. So those facilities include um, hospitals, uh, universities, um, medical clinics, medical centres. So I'd just like to change focus now and talk about the aged care project that um, we are currently um, undertaking. So the aim of this project is to map the existing evidence summaries, so map the existing aged care evidence summaries that we've already got on JBI's database to both the aged care quality standards and also the aged care quality indicator programs. 
So the aim is to, from the map, mapping exercise, identify those evidence summaries that we already have, that we can align with the standards and with the quality indicators. And then those evidence summaries can support and inform decision-making in the clinical setting. We also hope that we will find or identify opportunities for growth in the JBI aged care resources by conducting a gap analysis to identify those standards and those quality indicators that are not sufficiently represented in the JBI database. So just a little bit more information about the, the programs, the aged care programs that we're going to align our resources to. So the aged care quality standards and the quality indicator programs, they are two mandatory programs for Australian organisations that provide Commonwealth subsidised aged care services. So with respect to the quality standards, um, they ensure the provision of safe and quality care services to older adults who are um, living in residential aged care facilities or who are receiving in-home aged care services. There are actually eight individual standards that need to be uh, complied with, but for today's presentation, I'll just be looking at standard three, which is personal care and clinical care, and I'll provide a little bit more detail about what that actually uh, involves in a moment. Now, with respect to the quality indicator program, this requires that aged care uh, facilities, aged, aged care, uh, residential aged care facilities, um, measure, monitor and report 11 key quality indicators that have been identified as crucial care areas. And this information is used to determine the quality of care that older adults living in residential aged care facilities are receiving. So with regards to standard three, um, that actually um, involves these particular areas. And of course, these are the areas that we're wanting to see how many of our evidence summaries we can align to them. So the standard three ensures effective management of high impact or high prevalent risks. So we're looking at things like hydration, uh, hydration and nutrition, choking risk, medication safety, pain, delirium, hearing loss, prevention and management of pressure injuries, and minimising restrictive practices. Standard three also ensures needs, goals and preferences um, at end of life are addressed for the older adults. It, in, it ensures timely recognition and response of deterioration or change in mental health, cognitive or physical function. Standard three ensures documentation and communication of condition needs and preferences. It ensures timely and appropriate referral to other health facilities or other um, specialists. And standard three also ensures minimization of infection related risks. And this includes prevention and control in infection, as well as appropriate use of antibiotics. So as I said, we're trying to see how many of our evidence summaries we can align to these particular focus areas. Looking at the quality indicator program now, so remember this is just for older adults living in residential aged care facilities. So these were the key quality indicators that have been identified um, at this point in time. Um, so we're looking at pressure injuries, physical restraint, weight loss, medication management. So that's looking at, at polypharmacy, including antipsychotic use. Uh, looking at declines in activities of daily living, incontinence associated with dermatitis, hospitalisation to emergency department. It's also looking at workforce, for example, um, the number of, of staff who were turned over um, or you know, staff turnover, um, looks at consumer experience and quality of life. So again, we're looking to see how many of our evidence summaries we can align to these uh, crucial care areas. So I'd just like to provide you with an example of an evidence summary and its associated recommended practice and its audit criteria that we have been able to align to both the standard three and also to the quality indicator program. So as you can see in the example, I've used uh, pressure injuries here and they are both contained in, in the two programs that I've been mentioning. 
So this particular evidence summary is looking at prevention of, of pressure injuries. So repositioning and mobilizing strategies. And the research question was, what is the best available evidence regarding the effectiveness of repositioning or mobilizing strategies in the prevention of pressure injuries in adults, including older adults? Now, this particular evidence summary used systematic reviews and international guidelines as, as evidence to write the evidence summary. So as I mentioned previously, evidence summaries always have best practice recommendations. So for this particular example, there were 12 best practice recommendations. And these best practice recommendations, of course, came out of the evidence that's contained in the evidence summary. So we were then able to produce a recommended practice. So the recommended practice actually has the same name as the evidence summary on this occasion. And so this recommended practice was written using the best practice recommendations that came out of the uh, that came out of the evidence summary. And this provides um, procedural strategies that can be used in the clinical setting to help prevent pressure injuries by using repositioning and mobilizing strategies. So, and you'll find that, well, what actually will occur as well is that there will always be an evidence summary that, that underpins a recommended practice. There will never be a recommended practice that doesn't have an evidence summary that underpins it. Moving on, we were also able to develop audit criteria and again, this came from the best practice recommendations that came out of the evidence summary. And for this particular occasion, we came up with eight audit criteria. And this audit criteria can be used in the workplace to conduct a quality improvement project. So in closing, JBI aged care evidence-based resources can be used in the clinical setting to help support and inform decision-making by healthcare professionals in their workplace. There are a number of different types of JBI resources, um, and I've provided examples of the aged care resources today. If you'd like to know more about JBI aged care resources, go onto JBI's evidence-based practice database, and I've provided the link there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. That's a, a great example of uh, following through how you can summarise evidence and produce resources uh, useful for clinicians. I'd like to invite the, uh, um, the panellists now for our open Q&A session. So I'll just turn your videos on so that we can see you. So if I could just I have Jennifer and Ryan, excellent. So we'll have, just as a reminder to everybody that for the rest of the session, we're going to do uh, a question and answer. So if you have um, questions, please pop them into the Q&A section down at the bottom of the Zoom. The Zoom. Before we start, I would like to introduce Ryan Midgley, who is joining us for the panel. Thank you, Ryan. So Ryan has over 20 years experience managing in health and aged care and is currently in the position of the general manager of Calvary Aged Care South Australia and manages seven facilities. He holds a Bachelor of Medical Radiation and also a Diploma of um, Management and an MBA. So it's great to have someone from um, the clinical field joining us in our discussion. So I might kick off the first question. I know that there are some questions in the chat, but I'll kick off the first question to Ryan. Um, so Ryan, it'd be great to hear about what's going on in Calvary, but can you just sort of share from your experience, how do healthcare providers or clinicians engage and integrate evidence uh, within the context of Calvary SA? Uh, thank you, Kylie. Um, <clears throat> look, I just firstly want to um, acknowledge uh, Susan and Jennifer for their excellent uh, presentations. Um, look, we the aged care sector is going through some significant reforms at the moment. It's really exciting. It's very transformational, I think to see the passion and, and the amount of work that's being done to support us um, as providers is just exceptional. So thank you so much. And, and a big thank you to JBI for the invite to a Calvary and to myself um, to be here today. So hopefully I can provide a little bit of uh, context really from our perspective as providers and um, implementing evidence-based research 
Um, at Calvary, currently we are doing lots of different um, projects and research and implementing best practice. And um, Calvary, from an aged care perspective, provides care to over 6,000 individuals across our all of our homes nationally. So we've got about 63 homes. So there is a really big focus for us on how we can continually improve. And obviously that comes from our own culture of continuous improvement. It comes from the recommendations of the Royal Commission, but also opportunities where we see that we can improve the lives of our residents. And certainly that strongly aligns with our mission as Calvary. Um, so just a quick summary, I'm not gonna go into detail in, in, in the projects that we're doing, but we are currently uh, implementing a pretty significant model of care uh, around dementia care called the PEARS model of care, which is supporting uh, our residents live their best life as they uh, live with dementia. And we're doing a few of those trials in a number of estates at the moment. We're doing another um, evidence-based uh, project with the University of Sydney called iCharp. Um, and this uses principles of rehabilitation, person-centered and re-enablement approaches to uh, care to improve independence, safety, and overall health and wellbeing of residents with mild cognitive impairment and, and dementia and reduce avoidable costs in care. Um, another big piece of work that we're currently uh, in, in the very early stages of is the rollout of PayCop with um, ARIA and also the Violet project. So that is a large project looking at how we can improve palliative care across our services and also to support us in having some of those challenging conversations uh, with those nearing end of life and those that are supporting. Um, which is which has been fantastic and certainly something we're right in the at the very start of at the moment. So I'll talk to that shortly. Um, we've also got another uh, grant which we had from Aria to work on a food first approach to providing uh, food first approach to residents that are currently having supplements, and we're doing that trial uh, here in South Australia across two of our homes. Um, we've had some work uh, in a co-design uh, with University of South Australia looking at you know, the importance of the role that residents play in the delivery of care and services and certainly how we can best put their voice at the forefront of everything that we do. So um, that's had some early engagement of how we support um, our residents and a little bit of uh, activities already on, on getting some data and information from residents. Um, we've also uh, done a, a small uh, research project recently into uh, how we best support our staff deliver culturally appropriate care. Now we know that is a big challenge. Uh, we've got a multicultural workforce, which I absolutely love and celebrate in aged care. I think that's really exciting. We've also got a very uh, mixed cohort of, of culturally um, diverse backgrounds in residents. So how do we best support those residents, which is really important. Um, and look, there's, there's a, a lot of other work that we do um, and supporting our development of policy and procedure, which is related to the important work of uh, organisations like Susan's touched on before around developing resources that we can apply. And certainly there is a whole raft of information. Uh, you don't have to look too far to find so many resources to support us um, in the delivery of quality care and certainly aligning to all of the recommendations of of the Royal Commission. But I think what's really important when it comes to research and evidence is that, you know, as a leader in aged care, you know, providing here in South Australia care to around 530 residents is that some of this research and evidence base isn't about providing a holistic organisational change, but it may be just for one individual resident. I think it's really important that as providers, we do seek uh, improvements for individuals as well as holistically how we deliver care and I think that where we face various um, areas of improvement we can always find something we can do for someone that's going to make their life better as they age so I think that is really important um, and look as a as a provider I think it's really important the partnerships that we have with with uh, peak bodies with research with universities and Calvary has certainly um, taken a really proactive approach to building those networks and building those relationships so that, you know, we can be exposed to the latest in research or be the provider that uh, researchers want to come to, to, to get information from and to work with us really closely. Um, and we've got to expose ourselves to that as well, both as an organisation, but also individually. Um, and I certainly encourage my leaders to be actively engaged in what is happening 
outside of our organization. And sometimes there's things that we can actually adapt out of the healthcare industry as well, which I think is really important. In terms of effectively applying research and evidence, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of burdens in aged care and, you know, the workforce is challenged. We've got so many compliance requirements. So when we look at evidence-based practice and what we're going to implement or research we're going to engage in, it can't be an additional extra and it can't become a burden. So it is really important that we do, um, you know, be realistic about what we can do. I'm certainly someone who is very motivated and enthusiastic about doing all these great projects, but if it becomes a burden to our staff, then that is an issue. So we need to be really careful with that. And when we look at resources and our, our most recent implementation of mandated minutes, those minutes that we are providing a, a, a staff to, to, to roster uh, are for the provision of direct care. So we don't have a lot of supernumerary additional staff. So when we look at engaging with research, we'd like to see those resources provided to us to support us in, in really effective um, implementation and making that simple. Um, I think the other thing as well is that when we're engaging with research and some of the projects that we've done and you know, certainly the current PayCop and Violet project, it really is a multidisciplinary approach. And we need to be meeting regularly. We need to be setting expectations and develop an understanding. And with that, being able to provide some really tangible, simple resources that we can take to educate, which is absolutely pivotal to what we do, and then to deliver on those outcomes and implement change needs to be sustainable. So it's not about doing a quick little project and, and then move on to the next one. We've got to think about, you know, evidence-based becoming, you know, across policy and procedure. And in addition to that is about systems. And if we look at our work that we're currently doing with the PACOP, it's about looking at our clinical system and actually have made those changes already to have those assessments already in our system. So it becomes, uh, you know, daily practice that we're using those tools to improve the care that we're providing, which I think is really important. And I think um, along those lines, when we look at education and implementing uh, evidence-based practice, we need to educate all levels. We need to look at champion models. So having people, individuals that can really drive change, because if we rely on an individual to actually, you know, roll out a lot of this work and they go, then we lose that whole great amount of work and, and opportunity. So I think we need to be building those broad champion models across homes and, and multiple staff to really take up the lead in some of this great work that we're doing. You've um, touched, oh, sorry, Dwight, you've touched on so many, so many significant points there on co-collaboration, culturally appropriate care, individualised, to the person and as well as to the to the organization i was just what like, i think some of that there you, know, you were talking about how we need to educate and have it embedded um you know into our daily practices which i think ties in nicely to sort of one of our other questions is how do we go about you know, creating that evidence that research that innovation to actually be part of everyone's daily thinking daily practice um so I might just I might just ask Jennifer just to jump in and join in on the conversation, Ryan. But feel free to uh, you know join in after as well. Yeah. Look, and Ryan, can I just uh, many of the issues that you've touched on are things that we're actively discussing all the time in our work and our relationships because we understand that it goes from the micro right up to the macro level and the policy from the person to the policy and the older person to the workforce too. Um, going back to the question, I think for me, one of the things that's really um, critical in this is creating a culture that, that actually supports innovation, responsibility, recognition, observant, you know, observation. And I think that that sense um, when you were talking about individualised care, that really requires us to enable people to identify an issue. And then once that's identified, how does that get, is there something they can think about? Is there a way, what's the knowledge that can be shared locally? Is this a problem that's repeated? Does, is it something the organisation or the service needs to think about? So we need to encourage people to see and observe, but then also to think about what's been done elsewhere that might actually help this so that we actually, I think one of the beauties about research and evidence is we don't have to 
create everything again and again and again. We can actually find what other people have done and see not go down the wrong rabbit holes in a way, uh, I think is one of those um, issues as well. I think where possible, if we can support training and development for people to have the skills, and you've just talked about even the skills of working in multidisciplinary teams. I think these, these are really important ways for us to actually create that uh, culture uh, that we need to have to support this. And I think it is, there's also this health and aged care intersect. And I think, you know, Calvary understands that quite well because they've, they've actually got uh, feet in both camps, if you like. For many aged care services, it's the question of how much clinical care is coming in is also going to be an issue for these. And I think the other thing is really if we can get around to thinking what matters to the person and also if older people can identify what matters, maybe that will keep us on focus too in terms of what we need to be thinking about in terms of providing the best care, which is based on the best knowledge and best practice. Yeah. Okay, I just quickly say a couple of things. Um, and I think one of the things is there needs to be in the sector a level of vulnerability that, you know, maybe we aren't doing things right and, and what we think is best practice isn't best practice. So I think that can be an area that sometimes prevents us to go out and seek opportunities to improve. And I think as a sector, we're getting better at collaborating, but, but that is new because given the significant change that we're facing. And I think the other thing um, that is really important in all of this, as I always tell my staff and, you know, sometimes have to highlight to people, we work in our residents' homes. So, you know, the importance of dignity and respect of that in everything that we do is absolutely paramount. So if they're not being involved in continuous improvement and we're not solving their problems, then I think that, you know, we're probably missing the point in what we're doing. So I think that is really important. I've seen some great things come in that residents go, why would we, we don't want that. And we've just wasted a whole heap of time and money. So I think that is really important as well. Thanks, Ryan. I might just, we've got a question here. It's a slight shift into what we're talking about, but I think it would be useful to touch base on. Um, we've had Amy Finlay ask, how can we support graduates entering the sector um, to adopt evidence-based approaches? And I think you know, it would be important to get some insight into some of this as we're trying to build you know, capacity within the sector and, and have people who have an, you know, a evidence-based healthcare mindset, um, you know, who are, who are thinking about you know, best practices and how to improve care. So um, who would like, Jennifer or right, anyone would like to jump in and answer that one? I'm sure it's an easy question to answer. <laughs> I'm happy to start and then Ryan and Susan, you can join in. I think um, there's an increasing recognition about aged care as a destination for uh, people coming into work. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's strengthening and it seemed to be potentially a desirable place, which maybe 10 years ago was not quite as strong. I think obviously the question about transition to practice supports and actually connecting with those uh, facilities and activities is important. I, I think there are lots of things that both, and I guess it's partly at the healthcare versus the care worker and also the allied health uh, workforce, because the other thing is looking at what do we mean by the workforce? Is it the people employed by our service or our organisation? Is it the people who come in and deliver services? Um, so I think there's an understanding about the context of aged care. Um, there's a question about how people will adapt practice and many people may not have had a lot of exposure in undergraduate training if they're coming in directly into those areas, but many universities are trying to do placements in those in those issues. Um, working in the palliative care space, I mean, I think it's a challenge for a lot of people who enter into aged care to actually have to come to grips with that this is a place where people are ageing and where there is dying uh, occurring. So that would be there. I, th I think the question of how we support them, how we induct them, um, how we actually provide um, some level of supports in terms of debriefing and clinical supports are also critical uh, in these areas. And again, making use of what facilities are available to support uh, new employees and workforce. The, the Commonwealth is obviously quite interested as in state health is to have a workforce. Um, and a workforce that is, wants to sustain, they recognise these issues. So it's how we can sort of connect to all of those issues to wrap around the people, to see it as a good destination, to make sure there's opportunities for them to progress in the workplace as well, and to recognise the skills that they bring 
and the expertise that is practiced with our aged care. Uh, I think rather than seeing it as not the strongest care setting, I think there's opportunities for us to reframe. Yeah, but just really quickly, I think that you know what we're seeing in aged care is becoming subacute. You know, the what nursing staff are managing within aged care is becoming more complex and difficult. And I think that you know there is an absolute need for us to build capability and you know skills within the nursing workforce because rightly or wrongly i think we de skilled registered nurses within aged care i think we need to make it more more exciting there's huge specialty opportunities and if we look at the role of nurse practitioners going forward if i was going to you know look into a crystal ball we know that the gp workforce is challenged at the moment that's going to come less and less reliable we need to have highly skilled nurses so we need to create an environment that is attractive to undergraduate nurses that want to come and make a difference. Because I know that so many people do want to work in aged care. They're just not quite sure about what it is going to be like. And it's a complex role as well. So I think that we have a great opportunity in that space to really uh, make aged care the place people want to come and work. Um, Jennifer, this is just one of the early questions from your presentation that I'll just, um, while we've got a pause, quickly answer. Though I think uh, there was, uh, Valentin was interested in the resources from your hub and was wondering if they're available um, online, which I, I think you mentioned they were, and, and I guess if they were like freely available or accessible to people. Totally open access, totally free. Throw a chuck area in and you'll find everything that I've talked about today. Okay. As that's great. Uh, we're nearly coming to the end of the time, but I think I might just put in uh, one more question, if that's, I mean, we, I feel like we could be talking um, here for a lot longer than, than what we've had. Um, I might just jump, uh, well, I might just ask one question to each, uh, each of you. So perhaps uh, to, to Ryan, um, if you could just discuss perhaps if there's a specific challenge that you might have um, encountered uh, with trying to get people to uptake or integrate evidence and um, and then whether there's been any uh, strategies that you've found useful to help. I mean, you do see you've got a, quite a broad breadth of, of work um, that you talked about earlier. So is there any, you know, challenges that you see each time and have you managed to have you got the, the golden bit of information that everybody's wanting to know and how to fix it well, look, I, look i think like anything change is really challenging change is always difficult so i think bottom line is you've got to have good planning you've got to really set expectations set time frames identify your key resources um set accountabilities i think you've got to make that really clear I think probably what the one thing I would say is where I haven't seen evidence-based practice implemented well is where it's not monitored, you know, and people don't see the results. So if we're going to be implementing change, we've got to measure, we've got to constantly review it and look at how we can change because, you know, we sometimes implement things and there's a little thing that's not quite right that becomes a burden. And so people just go, oh, let's just not do that anymore. I think we've got to then look at that and go, what, how can we improve this? So it's, it is absolutely a culture of continuous improvement um, and setting that expectation up from the start. Um, I think what's been great to see if I look at my eight years in aged care, um, it's research was always very confusing and, and often came out with some really complex conclusions. And there was very rarely a really nice, concise resource provider to say, right, this is what we've been told, this is what we've found, this is what you can do. So I think those simple resources are really important as well. And I think, you know, any of us can go and access um, a website and find out, you know, ARIA and JBI to look at what resources are available. And I think that if we can apply those and adapt them and they're simple, that's going to help us be successful in the future as well. Great. Well, we've seen um, from both the present presentations today some really great useful resources. Um, we've just had a late question, um, which I think Jennifer probably you might be best to answer. Um, there it says they love listening to the presentation. So yes, it's been very interesting today. How can suppliers get involved with research projects and partner with industry leaders? Um, so look, I, I'd suggest they actually get in touch with ARIA because I think that's a lot of the focus of the aged care partnering project and also the ITP. It's about understanding partly the context of aged care uh, so that they can more connect and then connecting into the aged care and ARIA is a great way 
to do that um, as well. And I think the other part is we often talk to services about how they should be engaging with external industry to make sure that what is being created for them is actually fit for purpose in a way, if that makes sense. So very happy to have a moderator at ARIA. And I think that, that leads us, I'll just ask our last question, I know we're right on time, so I hope you don't mind us going over a little bit. Um, we'll just end on the, the last question that we have here around how we how you think, and I'll ask all of you to um, give a quick short answer, envisage collaboration and communication. So we've obviously talked about the different groups within the aged care sector. We've got the healthcare professionals, researchers, policymakers, um, industry partners, products, people, uh, but how do we, how do you envision, envisage collaboration and the way that we should be moving forward to try and um, improve care for the older person? Who would like to answer that? <laughs> I'll, I'll just quickly kick yeah. off. Um, you know, Calvary's recently established some communities of practice, which, uh, you know, get together and discuss latest research projects that we're doing, identifying opportunities we have. And I think um, across the sector, we need to uh, develop those communities of practice. You know, it can be in a virtual environment of this. It's about having conversations. I've been, been involved with some work with ARIA, uh, you know, in review of research, et cetera. And I think that if we can do that and also invite, you know, suppliers, invite research, invite someone potentially from outside of the aged care sector to come and, you know, put their lens on maybe a challenge that we face. I think that's where we start getting some great traction. And I think that APRA as a peak body has started to do some great work around that space. Um, and I think linking with those sorts of peak bodies like APRA will be really valuable for us as providers going forward. I think, uh, Today's a perfect example of those first steps for collaboration, isn't it? We've got research, uh, the clinical care people, we're all collaborating together today to try and um, you know, help in this area. So with that, our time has come to an end. So I would like to thank all of you, uh, our presenters, thank you so much for taking the time today, Jennifer, Ryan and Susan, for, um, I know your days are very busy, so thank you for taking the time out to come and um, chat to us today. As I mentioned before to everybody, um, this is being recorded and so a recording of this will be available online on the JBI YouTube channel. I'd also like to just acknowledge that this was a, a collaborative, a co-collaboration, uh, the JBI webinar with JBI and ARIA. So thank you, ARIA, for joining us um, in, in organising this webinar today. I hope everyone's found that just the presentations and the discussion really useful. I think there's been a huge amount of uh, resources and tools and lots of great discussions, um, more to have in the future. So a evaluation link will be sent to everybody. If you could please um, fill it out, that would be great. Um, that's the way we can improve our webinars and make them more useful to you. And so I thank you for joining us today. <laughs>